Welcome to Professionalism and Customer Service in the Healthcare Environment, Communications and Professionalism. This is Lecture A. The objectives for this lecture are to identify key elements of effective business communication, describe strategies for conducting effective meetings, and discuss appropriate effective use of media and technology in professional communication. Business communications can be described as any communication, regardless of the device or media used, that is necessary for the execution of your professional responsibilities. Emails to colleagues about a system problem or documentation of meeting minutes, presentations during meetings, webinar meetings, and phone calls from users are all examples of business communications. Being mindful of a few key guidelines can improve your written communication significantly. First, Consider your audience. Anticipating what their frame of reference is and what they want and need to know will help optimize your communication with those who receive your message. This is a particularly important consideration for a technical professional interacting with non-technical colleagues. For instance, if you were writing to inform a database administrator that the order entry system will be down and unavailable during the installation of a database patch, you would be very specific about the technical details, such as the size of the patch, the update number, whether it's a critical, bundled, or other type of patch, and so on. If, on the other hand, you were writing to a clinician, you would explain how the change will affect that clinician and when the system will likely be back up. You would not go into the technical details. Ensure your emails are also clear and concise. With healthcare organizations facing diminishing reimbursement rates coupled with expanding patient loads, providers and administrators tend to be chronically short of time. To increase the chances that your emails will be read and understood, make them as clear and brief as possible. Include a meaningful subject line that reflects the purpose of the email. For example, plan downtime for order entry system or project requirements comments due for 13-16. If a new topic is being discussed, even if you use an old email to find the sender's address, it's good practice to change the subject line to the new topic rather than leaving the old subject in place. Include only what the audience needs to know. Organize information visually by using headings and formatting, such as bullet points and underlining, to make it easier for your reader to quickly scan and absorb the content of your message. If action is needed, clearly indicate that both in the subject line by including a phrase such as action requested and in the body of the email, along with a date indicating when the action must be completed. Also include your title and contact information as part of your signature block in the email so that people understand your role and know how to connect with you. Another best practice is to use templates for common business communications, such as meeting agendas and meeting minutes. They provide a structured framework for the document that is efficient, time-saving, and familiar to the audience. It's often helpful to include screenshots or a flow diagram when imparting technical information about systems. For example, you might include screenshots when giving users instructions on a software system or communicating about which fields are going to change with a new version of an order entry system. If you're attaching files, be careful to use a commonly accepted format such as a PDF or a .docx file. If you receive questions from others, be sure to answer their questions directly, rather than drafting a long email as a response. Inline responses are typically the clearest. Finally, reread your email for clarity before you hit the send button. Look at an example from an IT staff member alerting employees to a phishing scheme that might appear in their inboxes. Note that this example spans two slides. Would employees be able to quickly scan and glean the key points? Not with that much unformatted verbiage. Because the information is not presented in a clear, concise way, many employees probably won't read it at all. Look at the revised email on this slide. First of all, there's much less information, just the key points. It's also organized with headings and bullets so that it's easy to scan. Note also that recipients can opt to ignore the information under the headings that don't apply to them, such as, what should I do if I already clicked on the link? Bolding is used to call attention to the key point so that it's not missed. In face-to-face -face communication, the person you're communicating with can pick up emotion through your tone of voice, facial expressions, and body language. 
These cues are missing in written communication, so tone has to be conveyed through words. To convey respect, include phrases such as please and thank you. Avoid patronizing phrases such as it's really easy and phrases that imply blame or criticism such as you neglected to or as we explained in the instructions we sent out. Expressing empathy and using positive language to talk about how you can help can convey a helpful, service-oriented tone. Avoid using language that's overly casual, such as catch you later, or abbreviations, such as LOL. Also, avoid background colors and decorative borders in your email templates. Don't use emoticons, such as smiley faces or characters made with the colon in parentheses. Many people view these types of elements as immature or unprofessional. Be sure to proofread your emails before you send them to correct typos and other errors. Respond to emails promptly. You'll also need to develop a system to track email exchanges to ensure that you follow up. Frequent lack of responsiveness and follow-through on your part can cause others to perceive you as unprofessional and unreliable. Different systems work better for different people. For example, you might want to use the flag function to indicate which emails require a quick response, or you might categorize them by color. Whatever system you prefer, just make sure you have one so that you can sort through your inbox and note which messages have priority. You'll also need a system for organizing your emails to be sure you can find them quickly and easily. Again, individuals have different preferences regarding how to do this. One approach is to separate your inbox into folders labeled, for example, by project, functional area, or date. Subfolders are helpful for high volumes of email, and it's a smart idea to learn to use your email client's search tools. Don't delete emails until absolutely necessary. Often, you will be the keeper of contracts and project communication. It's not unheard of to receive requests to produce timelines on communication several years after the fact. If you have not archived and kept these messages, producing a timeline will be difficult if not impossible. In addition, you should archive your emails periodically to improve performance of your email system. Let's look at another email example. What did Barry do wrong? The textured background makes it difficult to read the email message. Also, Barry's tone and language are more suited to personal communication with friends than to a professional communication. Barry's opinion of the online learning modules was negative and not helpful. The negativity was added to by the emoticons. He neglected to provide Dr. Winston with any contact information other than his email address. Additionally, he neglected to refer to Dr. Winston as doctor. Titles should not be dropped unless the recipient specifically asks you to do so. Look at another email from Barry. What did he do right? We can see that Barry was professional and polite in his tone and language, that he used a descriptive subject line, and that he provided his full contact information in case Dr. Winston needed to talk with him. It is also helpful to add a click here link in addition to the URL. A link makes it easier for the recipient to find the information, and you'll likely get higher response rates when you do so. If you receive emotionally charged emails, try to hold off for at least one hour before you respond. Waiting will allow you to cool down and respond with objectivity. You might also ask a colleague to read your response before you send it. Also, consider setting up a face-to-face -face or phone meeting with the sender, because that approach tends to humanize the interaction and de-escalate tension. Keep in mind that when people express anger, they're often just frustrated. Clinicians will sometimes project an adversarial tone in an email when they are really only venting over frustration with change. Talking with them will usually result in a less emotionally charged discussion and a path forward. Some strategies for de-escalating tension can include speaking softly and calmly and using phrases that express understanding of the other person's point of view, such as, it sounds like you had a frustrating morning, or I can understand how that would be challenging. As a health IT professional, you'll likely find yourself in the position of coordinating and leading meetings that include participants in all different healthcare roles. Let's look at some strategies for conducting effective meetings. Preparation is a key element to the success of a meeting. 
An important part of preparation is creating an agenda and communicating it to the audience through email or a shared document repository, such as a project intranet site or SharePoint site. The meeting attendees should be given the meeting agenda well in advance, a minimum of 24 hours, so they have time to prepare. Use of a template for the agenda, such as shown here, organizes the topics and speakers and facilitates the structure of the meeting. Appointing a facilitator is helpful in keeping the participants focused on accomplishing the agenda items and monitoring time. Having the agenda visible throughout the meetings helps to keep the participants on track. A standard practice is to designate a minute taker to document what occurs during a meeting. Following the meeting, the meeting minutes are distributed to the attendees within a predefined time frame, typically two business days. Using a standard meeting minutes template is the best way to ensure that the meeting notes are complete. The minutes should capture a list of attendees, decisions made, and action items or items that need further investigation by specified responsible parties. In the health IT arena, the first draft of the meeting minutes should be reviewed by key members of the meeting, and corrections should be made before the document is distributed to the meeting participants. If you're responsible for taking minutes, ensure that you listen attentively and take clear notes. Make special notations on decisions made and action items identified. For standing or recurring meetings, it's helpful to recap key decisions and check the status of action items in the subsequent meeting. If any statements by participants are unclear, it's appropriate to ask for clarification. You can also rephrase or restate what a person has said to confirm that your perception is accurate. This serves to solidify your understanding and reduce ambiguity. In health IT, ambiguity can be costly, resulting in development of incongruent solutions or acquisition of systems that will not work as intended. The simple practice of restating your understanding can greatly reduce this problem. You may also need to check with the group to clarify what exactly was agreed to by the group. Virtual meetings utilize various types of technology to facilitate connection with participants at different locations. Commonly used tools are Skype for Business, Webinar Platforms, Instant Messaging, IM, Video Conferencing, Voice over Internet Protocol, or VOIP, along with collaboration tools for electronic documents. Become familiar with all of the available functions before the meeting to make the most efficient use of the participants' time and make a confident professional appearance. Before recording a meeting, you need to obtain approval from the participants. Also, be sure you're aware of your organization's policies regarding the recording of meetings. Display the agenda to help keep participants focused. Be sure to introduce each member of a virtual meeting, not just those who may be co-located with you in a conference room. To reduce background noise, ask participants to mute their audio when they're not speaking. To promote engagement and focus, ask participants questions. One efficient way to quickly get input from the entire group is through the use of polls and chats. The inclusion of video can enhance feelings of connection among a group. However, you need to obtain agreement from participants prior to the meeting. Instant messaging, or IM, is another medium that's becoming more prevalent in healthcare organizations. The IT enterprise may support the use of IM sessions to cut down on the volume of emails for real-time communication. Organizations will typically provide guidance for the expected use of IM sessions and built-in archive functions for conversations. If this functionality is available, become familiar with it and all associated organization policies. The sharing of electronic documents within the healthcare organization can be accomplished by utilizing several different types of communication media and technology. Most organizations host an internal intranet website that can be used to publish and share documents across the organization. This requires an organizational commitment to a content management system and close coordination of changes. Within health IT, project documentation is typically accomplished by using SharePoint or other collaboration tools. Such tools allow for easier, more timely shared ownership and maintenance by the project team members. This concludes Lecture A, Communications and Professionalism. In summary, we identified strategies for effective communication in email exchanges and meetings.